Hi, everyone. My name is Joris Peels, and I work at Smart Tech Analysis. And we're the only dedicated additive manufacturing market research organization. And I'm the VP of consulting there. And we work together with uh, 3D Print to have been, been bringing you the best in 3D printing intelligence and news. And I am very, very happy to prove, well, to be a part of uh, introducing you to this webinar. It's unlocking the potential of metal AM. Uh, or unlocking the potential metal additive manufacturing strategies for scaling production with Velo 3D. So only a few years ago, about a decade ago or so, we were selling 100 metal machines a year. Most of them were destined for labs. And most of them were had lots and lots of settings, so you could do anything you wanted with them, except for make a lot of something. And uh, we've then moved towards manufacturing. And people now want to do much, much more complex things. They want to manufacture different locations in different materials to spec. Uh, we have standards, thank goodness, uh, which is wonderful. But that also puts us in a bit of a qualification kind of hell and trying to make everything work all the time. So how do we actually scale production? How can we repeatedly, reliably produce parts all over the place, maybe even different locations, maybe even different vendors or different suppliers to us? And how do we do that in a kind of manageable way? Uh, and, well, how do we make a part well, we used to be able to make one part. How do we make many parts that work all the time? That's kind of what we're doing. That's a challenge we're facing as an industry. Now, Velo 3D is a, a company, a startup, even though it's a publicly traded company now, that has really brought a lot of technology to bear to making the black box a little bit less mysterious and a little bit that is the melt pool, uh, to making the black box as the melt pool a little bit less mysterious and explaining what goes on there and really controlling that printer in a much more elegant way. And they've used this to try to unlock more accurate, higher resolution, uh, more reliable uh, 3D printing. And they're going to tell you today about their strategy for scaling production using their system and their ecosystem. So we've got two gentlemen today. We've got Mer Matt Karish, who's the Director of Technical Business Development at Velo 3D, and Sid uh, Raya, Raya, who's the uh, Technical Sales Engineer. Uh, Matt is, well, is really in charge of uh, finding exploring, industrializing uh, end part applications for Velo and uh, together with his customers. He got started in backup power generation, uh, moved to commercial aviation, uh, worked on high pressure turbine blade design, which you could uh, think is a lot of uh, uh, additive uh, kind of uh, interactions there. He's been in additive since 2017 and been working uh, mainly in laser powder bed fusion, also EB, uh, EB, more electron beam melting and bioenergetic. He's worked at the GE Aviation and Caterpillar, amongst other companies, and uh, has a mechanical engineering degree from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Sid is the, tech, is the technical sales engineer. He's in charge of like the technical training, part development, and kind of interacting with customers to get their parts made on the Vela system to see if there's a match there. He's also been working at AM since 2017. Uh, got been working at, uh, for over four years as an applications engineer and technical sales engineer uh, in laser powder bed fusion. Mm -hmm. He's worked at Bell, at, uh, Bell Helicopter, Textron, for six years in project engineering, drive systems, low value manufacturing, process development, and R&D. And he holds a, a Bachelor of Science from Mechanical Engineering, also from Georgia Tech, and for the Master of Business Administration from the UT at Austin. Uh, so uh, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar. Thank you so much for attending today. Um, you can ask questions. We will take time to answer them at the end. You can send in the questions uh, whenever you want, and we'll uh, collate them in the Q&A uh, button. Uh, and uh, and you have uh, access to the gentleman's email in front of you. So if you do have any relevant questions, you can uh, uh, ask them during the presentation or you can email them during after the presentation to get in touch with them directly. Or you can use a, a, a kind of a, a form, a contact form on the website. But feel free to ask questions. We're here to answer. That's the most interesting, exciting bit, apart from, of course, the presentation. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for attending. And thank you, gentlemen, for giving this presentation. And uh, well, it's my... Uh, turn to give it over to you. So Matt, Sid, have a wait with it. Thanks, Joris. We really appreciate you guys having us on and uh, giving us the opportunity to, to speak today. All right, thanks. So we'll get into kind of setting the stage of scaling additive manufacturing and why is it so difficult? What are the challenges? What are the things you need to address? Um, some of the main things that, that customers run into when trying to scale um, added manufacturing, cost, qualification, and development, amongst many others, right? But um, some of the major ones that tend to pop up 
uh, across a lot of the different qualification efforts, regardless of industry or application. And so drilling into some of those a little bit more, starting with cost, there's this concept of value density, um, right? So on the left, an automotive example, and on the right, an aviation example, if you think about taking a piece of turbo machinery, so in automotive, uh, plenty of turbochargers exist um, in all different types of uh, cars and uh, trucks that are on the road. Uh, but in reality, you know, average price of, of those types of products, call it $50,000 and rough average weight, 2000 kilograms. So anything on that type of product is roughly valued at about $25 per kilogram. Simple math, you just take the dollar value and divide it by the weight. Um, when you look at a similar type of machinery, so again, turbo machinery, but in this case, in aviation, so focusing on the, the engine of the aircraft, um, in the aviation space, this type of product, uh, the, the airframe itself on the order of $100 million and weighing in roughly at 40,000 kilograms. Um, that's obviously a gross overgeneralization, but can give you a rough idea of what a piece of hardware on that type of uh, product should be valued at in terms of density. So on the order of $2,500 per kilogram. So orders of magnitude more valuable, even though you're looking at approximately the same type of application, turbo machinery. So first and foremost, the, the applications that you're going after, they have to be, they have to have a home in the right value density uh, industry or space. So will additive be a good fit for turbochargers in automotive? Likely not. Will additive be a good fit for turbo machinery and aviation? Absolutely. And we see it today. Um, so there's a, a ton of opportunity out there, right? That, that does have good value density for additive manufacturing. So the, the space automotive, um, high end automotive, like racing and specific heat exchangers, um, tooling of automotive. So high pressure die cast tooling, aviation, um, even oil and gas and uh, power generation, there's a ton of high value density applications. With all those opportunities, why don't we see more applications out there in additive manufacturing? And when you really get into the details of it, the, the qualification challenge that presents itself are fundamentally broken down into the ability to generate parts that have two major things repeatable material properties and repeatable geometric features, geometric accuracy. And that's not only within a single machine um, across a single build plate, but across build to build within a machine. But really when you're talking scale, it's from machine to machine, from supplier to supplier, week after week, month after month, year after year. The ability to do that one thing that you did over and over in multiple different instances. So in additive, the challenge that we see to qualify and try to achieve those things noted on the previous slide is that the majority of the legacy additive ma manufacturing systems out there behave like snowflakes. They're all unique. And so each machine, regardless of if it's same manufacturer, even same machine model, um, are generally requiring unique processes to print uh, the same part uh, off of that machine. And part of that is driven by the way that the industry has approached things like calibrations and the ability to go from machine to machine. A lot of these things are very manual processes and not user-friendly to do, therefore they aren't done very often. Another thing to consider is that a lot of these suppliers are developing their own processes. So you have manufacturer A and service bureau B running the same additive manufacturing equipment, but they've developed their own little unique processes to build the same parts, whether it's thin wall process parameters 
or low angle process parameters. They've done it their own way. So you get this really fractured supply chain of different bespoke or uh, kind of artisanal processes and the way people have approached the additive manufacturing um, process, if you will. Take that a step further, some of those people are considering that um, intellectual property and they're not uh, keen to share that process or how they've developed that process. So if you are working with one of those, those companies that does in fact view added manufacturing in that fashion, uh, you're more or less locked in. Um, so combine a lot of these high level concepts and ultimately what you end up with is a large amount of variation even if people are running the same pieces of equipment across the industry. And when you have a large amount of variation, you now have a process that is unscalable, which makes it uh, effectively unable to generate design allowables because you will be characterizing such a large amount of variation that the sigma on your design allowables will be effectively so large that they will be unusable. And ultimately what that means is every time we're trying to bring on a new machine or a new supplier, we're reinventing the wheel over and over and essentially starting from ground zero, step one, to qualify and try and make these processes into production processes. So what does it look like for Velo to actually go achieve part qualification? And at the kind of fundamental level, what we're trying to do is drive standardization within the additive manufacturing system. So doing things like having the software prescribe a generalized and arguably common manufacturing process across all of our Sapphire printers, um, meaning everyone is kind of starting from the same place, pulling from the same recipes, building these parts from the same common process parameters, is a, a kind of fundamental requirement to introducing this concept of standardization. In, in combination with that, the ability to design for function, not for a manufacturing technique. The caveat being we all understand that there will always need to be the consideration for the manufacturing technique used. In our case, additive manufacturing, there are limitations, physics still exists but the ability to push the limits of what we're able to do and eliminate things like support structures um, or reduce them and really try to get to the ultimate functional geometry that the part needs, um, including things like automated machine calibrations. So instead of having your machine calibrated by a field service engineer from the OEM and having that done on a rhythm of once every three or six months, and putting your entire production at risk between those calibrations, make it automated and easy for the technician to run those calibrations. Whereas you're running that calibration as often as once a week or even once every single build and keep your machine well-centered in the process. So you don't risk drifting out of what would be an acceptable and qualified process. Having things like single source of truth print files that are machine serial number agnostic. Um, so making a locked down unmutable file that contains all the laser instructions and will run the exact same laser commands regardless of what machine you put it on. And then early on having well integrated process monitoring and machine and process health uh, inspection verification and um, recording to make sure that everything you said you wanted the machine to do, it actually did. And oh, by the way, here's a nice document that summarizes the health of that build in the machine during that process that rolls right into your quality control system. Um, and then lastly, using all of this standardization to generate a pedigreed material database uh, that can be recognized by regulatory and certifying bodies, think things like, FAA and EASA and uh, oil and gas, like API uh, regulatory bodies. So trying to almost flip the industry on its head and say, 
instead of reinventing the wheel every time, start with this really solid standardized approach and doing that through a, a multitude of different avenues to then allow uh, really, really easy adoption as you're bringing on new machines, new suppliers, uh, new materials. And, and when you try and put that into the purview of qualifying an actual part, what does that look like? And so this is a highly oversimplified version of the process for qualifying an additive part. But in general, you're going to start on the left and with material qualification. That's where you're developing your process parameters, understanding the outputs of uh, the instructions that you've developed and what kind of material properties you're going to get. Um, and the way we are helping in that specific space are things like common parameters and the ability for additional design freedom. And again, generating that pedigree data. The next step is you're gonna be moving into qualifying your printer. So the hardware itself, making sure that it is producing the material that you originally intended when you develop those initial process parameters. Um, so things like that auto calibration, in the process monitoring and the ability to do a delta qualification rather than a full blown uh, requalification or initial qualification of that printer. Next, you're gonna move into a printed part. So you've got your process, you've got your hardware, you combine those two to generate a geometry, right? And so when you do that, that's when you're gonna do things like first article inspections, maybe check additional tensiles, density, those type of things to make sure that that geometry and those materials came out as intended. And again, the way we're helping there, things like common print files where you've got all the laser commands baked into a fixed uh, file that can be taken from machine serial number to machine serial number without any changes and reproduced uh, every single time. So that repeatable output, and again, the Delta qualification. And we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the fact that there are things outside of the additive manufacturing process that are critical to qualifying additive manufacturing parts. So you still have things like heat treatment and machining and post-processing and surface finishing that will all be critical to your final application. Um, not that we have the ability to necessarily control those within the additive machine, but it needs to be understood. And if you have a very repeatable, reliable input to those post-processing uh, techniques and um, requirements, it makes the back half of the process uh, qualification significantly simpler. So with that being said, I'll hand it over to Sid, who will walk you through an actual uh, case study that we did in the oil and gas sector. Uh, thanks a lot, Matt. Um, it's good to be here. Um, thank you guys for, for taking the time out of your day to um, attend our webinar. Um, I do see, before we get into the case study, there's a question here. Uh, and the question is, can you print metal PCB on a metallic filament uh, to be placed within a twisted yarn sheet? Um, so just being honest, that's not my area of expertise, uh, PCBs, but the questions that I would ask here are, uh, around feature size and how small are you trying to print and what metals? Um, but yeah, Leslie, if you want to reach out, uh, separately, we can certainly look at that, uh, unless Matt, you have any other comments to add? Nope. Agree with you. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. So as Matt mentioned, um, We'll look at a case study here in the uh, energy or oil and gas uh, sector uh, that has to do with scalability and how do you scale uh, production of parts. Um, and so in order to do that, I, I, I do want to set the stage a little bit. Uh, the customer that we worked with uh, here is IMI Critical um, and the application or the types of parts that we're talking about um, is called the choke valve. Um, you can see them in the photos, but really what, what a choke valve is, right? It's a, it's a part that has a lot of complex fluid passages. Um, it's used in harsh environments and upstream oil and gas applications. Um, and so for those reasons, right, it's a good AM part because there's complexity there. So it, it checks those boxes. Um, but then the other interesting thing about these things is, uh, you know, the need for these is relatively, I'll say, low volume, but a high mix. Um, so many different part numbers uh, that are slightly different 
um, which is why it also becomes a really good fit in AM. Um, and so in this case, right, our customers already delivered hundreds of AM parts, right? Um, but they needed to scale, right? They needed to make more. Um, they needed to um, up, their, up their manufacturing numbers. Uh, but the issue that they were having uh, really related to the scaling of AM parts was really related to the variation um, of parts, part quality that were coming off of these machines. Um, and that variability, right, was it could be anything from uh, build to build or machine to machine. Um, we won't even get into the whole site to site thing, but that that is another um, area. So all these essential variables that go into making a quality parts uh, were not in control, and that made it harder to scale up from one machine um, for for the added production capacity. Um, in addition to that, because of the inherent variation uh, in those essential variables, uh, qualifying alternate vendors right uh, becomes a nightmare. Um, there should so much manufacturing variability from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, and for each one of those, you almost have to look at it like a unique qualification um, and, and really dedicate a lot of resources and costs um, to bring on a new supplier. Um, and then there's also the regulatory aspect to this, right? Um, API 20S uh, is a spec uh, in the oil and gas spec, uh, sector that controls um, it's a process spec, right? That controls the AM process for making AM parts. Um, it kind of lays out the how of, of making parts. Um, and so part of that is also documentation to ensure part quality. Um, so that was part of the challenge that they were having too. And so, you know, when you talk about those challenges, right? This is just a graphic of what um, the current landscape was right at the time, um, you had an OEM that wanted to um, scale their production, right? Let's say that they're making a part in-house. Now they wanna onboard different suppliers. And so in order to do that, right, they're onboarding a first supplier. Um, that costs some level of NRE, um, non-recurring expense, right? Some cost uh, to onboard a supplier, uh, qualify a serial number one machine, um, do a essentially a full qual, right? And, and develop a print file that's gonna make parts on that machine. Um, now, adding a second machine at that same supplier, right? Um, is also gonna take the development of a new print file um, and cost associated with that, right? And then there's a Delta qual involved. And so in this case, you've got, you know, two machines at the same supplier requiring a lot of um, cost to onboard. Now that whole cost essentially doubles when you add a second supplier, right? Because now you have to treat that first machine at a second supplier the same way that you treated the first machine at your first supplier, and so on and so forth. And so what you have, right, are is a is a very um, fragmented supply chain of um, a. It's very expensive and not very feasible to scale. But B, you have like all these different print files that everyone's making using their own sets of parameters and um, uh, a very bespoke uh, approach to making parts. Um, and, and after a while, that just, it doesn't work. It doesn't necessarily uh, scale uh, like you would want it to. Um, and so now, right, with that, with that stage set, um, the first part of this effort, right, was just to make the part one time, right? Um, and that was the initial qualification. So we worked with this, uh, with this customer, IMI, uh, and produced that first production valve, right, using the Velo 3D technology. Um, the requirements from API 20S, the American Petro uh, Petroleum Institute spec, um, uh, applied to that first article, and AMSL indicates the criticality of this. So AMSL3 is the highest criticality part uh, in that spec. Um, so this is a very high critical, criticality part that we were able to build um, on our system and conform um, to, to, those, uh, to the requirements of you know, uh, API 20S. Um, also, on the documentation side, API 20S lays out the essential variables that, um, that you need to document to go along with that AM process. Um, Velo 3D is a sure build report, uh, captures all of those seamlessly right out of the gate. 
Um, that was a very nice bonus for us uh, to be able to say that. Um, then last but not least, right, you got to, once the part's printed, you got to make sure it works like it's supposed to. It flows um, fluid like it's supposed to. So flow tests, right, were, were functional testing that was conducted to validate um, that the parts were good and they worked like they were supposed to. So for this part, right, um, you know, we were able to show equivalency to the non-AM version of, of this uh, component. So our initial win is um, basically just being able to produce a non-AM component on the Velo 3D um, AM technology um, and be able to do that initially, right? And then, you know, deploy it out into the field uh, to get installed. Um, and so that was the first sort of major milestone. Um, and so from there, right, uh, the scaling production study is, is where, is what, what's next. Um, so then, you know, we worked with our customer and said, okay, well, what if we took that same print file, right, that we had used for that initial um, qualification and for that initial um, set of components, use that same print file and farmed it across a network of contract manufacturers, um, would we be able to get the same results, right? And that's what we did. And so the approach there was, let's take that print file and a statement of work um, and have um, six different CMs uh, run that statement of work, right? So uh, the locked in print file printed on their Velo Sapphire system. Um, we had six CMs involved. Um, four of them were in the United States, one in Europe and one in Asia. So it's kind of a global effort here. Um, and in addition to just validating, uh, you know, flow testing, uh, we also, you know, the API document also prescribes uh, material test coupons that you need to have and whatnot for further ver uh, verification, right? Because um, functional testing is only one piece of it, but you also need the material properties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so this just gives you an overview of what was tested, right? So mechanical properties um, and then also functional testing. Um, the, the CMs that uh, ran these builds, right? Like you can see is, you know, we had a, we had a couple in Texas, uh, one in California, Oklahoma. Uh, we had one in Austria and in South Korea. So, so there's really, this is a, a big deal from a global um, aspect as well. So all of those CMs ran that same print file, right? Um, and when it came to the flow testing of the parts that came off of the printers, right? We saw some really good results from a functional testing standpoint. Um, we were able to test those uh, cages, right? Those choke valves um, to be within the allowable limit of what their flow needed to be, um, which tells you that there's a, you know, the, the, the channel sizes, um, are uh, consistent across builds, right? But also the surface finish is uh, consistent across builds. Um, so that was some very good results that we saw there. And, uh, and in so, addition, sorry, go I ahead, Matt. Say real quick, Sid. I think it's it's important to note that the variation of flow shown on this graph it correlates to plus or minus two thousandths of an inch deviation on the flow channels. Um, yep. To give yep. people a, a perspective of how tightly controlled the, the geometry was across all these prints. Yep. Um, and then in addition to the flow testing results, um, you know, we were able to meet the customer um, mechanical property requirements too. Uh, in this case, we were up against a UTS and a yield strength requirement, um, which we were able to meet uh, and exceed uh, the customer spec. Um, on this effort. And so what does that mean, right? Um, the, the end goal here, right, is you want to be able to scale your supply chain. Um, what this does, right, for the customer is uh, lets them qualify parts um, in such a way, right, with a lot of confidence that, you know, if they're qualifying uh, parts at a certain supplier, onboarding a supplier or onboarding another machine, right, is not as cumbersome, right, because of that consistency in the process control. Um, and, and this is something that, that really is key when you're trying to, trying to scale your supply chain. Um, it reduces that concern of, of you know, uh, bespoke machine parameters. Um, 
you know, it, it, it removes that need to reinvent the wheel each time. Um, you've got a control process parameter that everybody's using, right? So when that print file comes in, um, that process has already been defined. So you're not having to sift through lists of parameter sets and develop your own um, or anything like that. Um, then, right, on the printer side, as the parts are printing, um, Assure, which is our quality mo monitoring software, um, it's monitoring the build itself but it also calibrates the system. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but then at the end of it, right, there's two deliverables. There's the actual hardware, right, that the customer goes and validates, whether it's by functional or mechanical testing. But then there's also the documentation, the Assure report that goes along with it. Um, and as you start to scale that supply chain, right, it's something that's like a PDF that seamlessly goes into um, the customer PLM system. Um, and they're used to looking at that information uh, no matter what uh, contract manufacturer um, they're they're going to for these types of components. So overall, right? Um, I think this is the theme of today, right? Scaling. Um, that's what we're doing today is is by using the Velo technology, um, really building a more scalable supply chain for our customers. And then we'll take you through another short one from a space OEM that we work with, uh, kind of the same uh, vein of scalability and repeatability. So a customer that I was working with that ha was having trouble with uh, a highly sensitive combustion geometry for a rocket engine. And um, on the right, you'll see a graph and we had to highly sensitize it um, because of what it represents. But effectively, these are discharge coefficients being measured out of uh, this, call it sensitive part. And the right side of the graph is showing their kind of original state of manufacturing where they had three different manufacturers or, th or three different service bureaus running the exact same vendor and ser uh, model number additive manufacturing system. Um, and within each machine saw acceptable variation, but the second they were trying to scale from one to two to three machines, variation from machine to machine was wildly unacceptable. So we presented them with this concept of our golden print file where we generate this single source of truth this file that has all of the laser instructions built into it that is not changeable and send that across our contract manufacturing network and, and prove to them and honestly to us as well that we could do better. And so the graph on the right in, in the blues is showing the discharge coefficients of uh, parts printed at four different Velo contract manufacturers, uh, all running Sapphire printers in the same alloy, obviously. Uh, and you can see the extremely tight distribution of variation to each other uh, across those different printers, which um, we were thrilled and the customer was thrilled about. So this is on their, call it large flow samples. So think on the order of five millimeters. And then they also had a, a different set of geometry on the same part that they characterized as small whole flow samples. So think sub three millimeters in diameter. And you see the same thing um, where machine to machine across the legacy uh, network, it, the variation is just unacceptable to their, their spec. And what we were able to produce was well within the variation they needed for their engine performance. So these results actually enabled them to start shifting their, their additive supply chain to Velo and really give them the power to generate these, these print files and then choose who and when and how big to scale their supply chain more or less uh, at the drop of a hat because they know that if they have this, this print file and they send it out to the network, they will get the same results back. So whether they're building you know one to two development engines or they need to scale to 50 uh, production engines, they can turn on and turn off this network uh, as needed. Um, so I guess we, we'll go into the how um, a little bit on how we're, we're achieving this repeatability. 
Um, but again, I want to maybe pause for a second and answer some questions. We've got three questions. Um, so the first one um, from Michael is 2000s inch out of what channel dimensions? Um, I'm assuming you're talking about the, um, the flow control valves, the choke valves on the, um, the first case study. Um, I don't know the exact channel, but they were under five millimeters. Um, and uh, I hope, well, I hope that answers the question. Um, do you have anything to add there, Matt? Uh, no, it, it's with respect to, I, I think the question is asking like height uh, or width, most likely. Yeah. Um, yep. and, and they're square channels. Yeah, so it's, it applies to all. Yep. Um, okay. And then the other question uh, from Justin, um, did you guys account for variations not controlled by your machines? Um, it looks like each CM was very consistent, but CM to CM was less consistent. Um, yeah. So that's, that was an actually very interesting learning for us, right? Um, uh, in terms of that uh, CM to CM consistency, for example, um, I don't know, Matt, will you flip back to that slide? Yeah. Um, the, yeah, so this slide right here. Um, so this is interesting too, because if you look at CM1 um, that printed the two cages, uh, their standard process um, in terms of post-processing is to vapor hone all their parts that have these internal channels, right? And so naturally what we saw was that these vapor honed parts um, had a higher uh, flow coefficient. Uh, it still fell within the allowable tolerance, um, but that was something we, we realized and learned, right? Was like, okay, machine to machine consistency is great, but post-processing, right? That is also very, very critical. Um, so when we talk about process control, right? In the grand scheme of, of, of production parts, you have to control the whole process, the machine and the post-processing um, for what we're doing right uh, at Velo, we're, we're making it easier, as easy as possible on the machine side, because that's where the uh, most pain points are today. Um, so that was one question. Um, oh gosh, uh, this is another one from Clement. Um, if the allowable flow variation value shown on slide 18 represent plus or minus two thou on printed parts, how do flow variations on subtractively made legacy parts compare from different shops with different CNC machines uh, and any rework such legacy parts might require to achieve acceptable flow variations? Thanks. Um, so on the subtractive side, um, flow variation was never really the issue for these types of parts. The way that they make them today, right, is they have these disc stacks that have these channels machined in them, and they stack them on top of each other and sort of braze weld them together. Um, so the issue with that process isn't like a um, the variation per se, but it's more of a um, uh, like scrap rates and and just having a high mix of parts and different shaped channels and stuff like that, right? So the the challenges are not as performance related as they are. Um, uh, manufacturing and scrap and that kind of thing. So right out of the gate, right? That's why on that first part, we had to prove that we could compete from part performance standpoint with the subtractive uh, version of the part. And, and this may be a little bit of an assumption, but I believe the, the flow tolerance upper and lower limits was derived from what they were achieving on the traditional side of things. Yes. Yep. That's right. That's right. Um, okay. So, uh, getting into the how, right? How are we achieving that repeatability? Um, and so at the highest level, uh, what we want to do, right, is break down the how into two categories, right? Um, the most critical thing is the calibration, the system calibration, what you're doing prior to that build. Um, and then the second part is you got to monitor and watch what's going on within that build, right? And for both of those categories, right, you've got these, uh, you've got to make sure that your gas flow is correct. You've got to make sure that your optics are healthy. Uh, and then you got to make sure that your powder bed um, is reliable um, from, you know, both from a calibration standpoint and uh, a uh, layer by layer standpoint. 
So getting into the optical health, right? Um, what we're doing, right, is uh, in order for any Sapphire printer that's in the fleet to be able to consume um, one print file, right? So a single print file can be run by any Sapphire in the fleet, assuming it's running that alloy, of course. Um, but the reason why we're, the way that we're doing this, right, is to make sure that through automated calibrations, um, we are uh, taking that machine to machine variability out of the equation as much as possible. Um, on the optics side, during the calibration, um, we look for positional accuracy of the lasers as well as laser to laser assignment. Um, that's probably the reason, it is the reason why you're not gonna see a stitch line on uh, a Velo part that's been printed with multiple lasers. Um, we also check focus uh, as well as beam stability and all of these things are, are automated, right? So there's not a manual, um, you know, taking a build plate out of the machine, going to a CMM, measuring it, and then coming back to compensate. Um, they're all automated. Um, in addition to that, so that's the, the pre-build side of it. Um, during the build, um, we're looking to see every layer that the lasers are aligned with one another. Um, and we want to do this every layer because as the system is running, things are heating and cooling and your build plane may shift, right? But that shift should not affect the ability of the two lasers to work together. Um, so that's that's one of the big things that that enables um, optical health. Um, next, we're looking at an optimized gas flow. So depending on you know customer preference or alloy, we're running either argon or nitrogen. Um, you know you want to be at this balance of being able to carry away the soot and um, you know whatever's coming out of the plume into the filters. Um, but you don't want to blow too fast, right, to erode powder away. And so the way we're watching that, um, right, is, is uh, we're watching the health of the powder bed um, to make sure that our gas flow is correct. Um, and that's been, you know, optimized um, as well. Um, the other thing that's a little bit unique is we found that um, through legacy systems that the optical window, right, um, tends to get a lot of soot and condensate and just build up on it and it tends to just get dirty. Um, so we've designed our machine architecture to have a sort of a slight positive flow in the optics window. Um, and that ensures that none of that stuff is getting carried into that window and contaminating it. So not only is your window clean to start with, right? Um, you, you're making sure that it doesn't dirty up during the process uh, and lead to any type of thermal lensing or, or anything like that that might compromise part quality. And it's, it's probably worth mentioning that you eliminate another kind of human variable by exactly. if part of your process is to manually clean a window to prepare every single build. What are the chances you scratch or damage that window in that process exactly. or you don't properly clean it? Yep. Yep. Um, so on the powder bed um, side, right, this is, this is also a little bit unique um, to what we're doing. Um, we have uh, a tool that we call Height Mapper. Um, and essentially what it is, is it is a uh, structured light scan um, that maps a point cloud across your powder bed. Um, and that is used to um, monitor the topography of your powder bed, right? So your topography, right? It's going to be affected by any parts protruding out of the powder bed. So if that's happening, um, you'll catch that here. Uh, but also if there's any type of short feeds where you're not getting enough powder, right? Um, that will also get, get captured here. And so essentially this, this point cloud will, will say, okay, is my, um, powder bed, uh, to the layer thickness that I want it. Uh, is it smooth and is it planar? And if all that is a go, then I start lazing, right? So, um, so powder bed health is something that's extremely important as well, um, because you need that powder bed to be stable over time, um, especially for, for high criticality parts. Um, and so what we're doing, right, is, is we're using all of this technology across all of the Sapphire family of printers, right? And you see that the differences here, right? We've got the Sapphire uh, and the Sapphire XP. Uh, the Sapphire is a 315 millimeter build diameter by 400 millimeter tall. 
Um, the 1MZ version of that is the same diameter, but it stretches the height out to a meter. Uh, and then the Sapphire XC is a 600 millimeter build plate, right? With a 550 height, um, or on the 1MZ version, you have the full meter available too. Um, another key difference here is the Sapphire system is a dual laser system. Um, and the Sapphire XC is, um, it's an eight laser system. Um, and so because of the way that we, we uh, monitor or we calibrate um, and check our optical systems, right? Uh, we're able to do uh, some really unique things with multi-laser capability and uh, positional accuracy, even when eight lasers are printing on one part. Um, and I think that's uh, uh, somewhat unique as a standard out of the box capability. Um, and so, you know, uh, I think as far as the actual presentations go, like that, that's all we had. Um, but I think Doris, uh, I'll let you. I'll let you take it. But I think we're going to questions. Maybe next. Yeah, definitely, definitely, guys. Thank you so much. That was that was really nice. I was really. I learned some things. So that's always good. Um, so we have one um, question already from the always inquisitive anonymous attendee, uh, and uh, that is the what is the cost per part versus regular machining? Do you have a percentage? So this is, of course, a very difficult question to answer. Uh, yeah. And there's two things that I'm not sure. What the, you know? I think they mean compared to regular machining if I would make a, a part. And that's, of course, it's an almost impossible question to answer. It depends on what kind of part, uh, what I'm going to do with that part, what thin it is, where I start with materials. So how would you answer? I mean, I think I think potentially I might even answer it. Like, what is the value of that geometry to you? And what is the value of getting that geometry precise? It's more, that's the kind of more abstract way I would answer it. But I don't know how well you guys would do with that question. Yeah, uh, I, I think... There's a bunch of ways to answer that, but like, first and foremost, if, if it is a machined or cast part, you know, that is, has a well-defined solution today, you are likely almost never going to compete on cost with additive manufacturing. Um, alternatively, have you designed a part that can be made no other way than additive manufacturing, then your traditional cost is essentially infinity right? Uh, because you can't make it. So incredible, like you said, incredibly hard question to answer. Um, if you're comparing to something that's made today, you're likely more expensive. If you're truly designing with the benefits of additive in mind, uh, you're likely going to extract enough value that makes that cost worth it. Yeah, for sure. And I, I, you know, one, one other example of that, right. Is, um, you know, when you think about in practical terms, you've got you know, let's say a part that you're conventionally manufacturing that's going into, um, you know, an oil and gas supplier's uh, machinery, right? Um, and if that machinery goes down, right, your refinery comes to a screeching halt. And so, you know, yeah, in that case, maybe the additive part is more expensive, but if your lead time to get the non-additive version is like six months or more, and you're getting the additive part in six weeks, um, every day that that refinery is down is more of a reason to pay that premium on that AM part. So uh, context in that is extremely critical. Yeah. Agree. Agree. But, uh, and yeah, it's also, it's, it's like you, you said with this, this kind of density, this performance density or this part density is dollar density per part. It all really depends on how close the tip of sphere of the application is and how important that part is. Um, you know, um, but so that's, I think, a good point. But so if we're talking, well, if you're, let's stick to cost a little bit. Feel free to answer your question, ask questions right now in the Q&A thing. If you want, guys, that'd be really helpful and wonderful. Uh, and uh, yeah, generally got some more questions. So one of them is, okay, so we're seeing, we've got two different examples, space and oil and gas or energy markets. Like that, that's, those are very, very different industries. So we've got very different costs of quality. We've got very different costs of like something failing, you know? Um, uh, you know, so, so how does it, like, if we're deploying additive, you know, how, how does it, is it, is it very different if you're deploying it for a uh, space company than for, for, for an oil and gas company? Are the considerations very different? They can be. Um, I mean, at the, at the very, my first gut reaction is, you know, the types of parts that you're looking at, they're going to look very different. They're going to have different requirements. Um, so there's requirements from a performance standpoint that are, that are different. Um, but I think more, at least what I've seen is um, different industries may have different um, like qualification type requirements, right. Related to the manufacturing process. 
Um, so essentially they're all trying to do the same thing, right? You want quality, you want reliable, repeatable quality. Uh, but the way that they go about it in the level of rigor that's required to show that, uh, can be different across different industries. Yeah. I think if you strip away the applications you're trying to print and fundamentally just look at the manufacturing technology, uh, mm -hmm. it should be approached no differently than, casting or milling or forging, right? You still need all the quality documentation in place. You still mm -hmm. need all the repeatability, scalability, the design allowables. So when you look at it from that perspective, uh, you honestly should just treat it as another manufacturing technology. Um, there will be nuances in like API 20S versus FAA requirements and that type of stuff. And like, how much data gathering you have to do, how much statistical um, studies you have to do and, and building that confidence. But at the fundamental level, honestly, it, it should be treated no different than any other manufacturing technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got a question from Leslie Roth and that is what would be your dream customer considering the current state of the industry? So what kind of dream customers would we have? And I don't know if they're looking for like, you know, the industry or the type of customer, my dream customer is somebody who can't make a part another way, <laughs> but, uh, but like uh, what kind of like uh, industry or what kind of the customers do you guys like uh, enjoy working with? Um, well, so I, I think, you know, I, I would say if you'd asked me the same question, probably three years ago, I would have said something, you know, along the lines of the coolest part that has like the coolest functional value uh, something with topology optimization and, and that type of stuff, right? Um, but I think today my answer is a little bit different. And I think uh, as we go deeper, right, with AM, like to me, the perfect customer is the one that is serious about going into production um, with AM, right? Because that's where the fun, in my, I mean, I'm a technical guy, so uh, mm -hmm. that's where the fun happens, right? It's, it's, uh, it's gotten for me to be less about what type of cool geometry you can make and more about how do you stand up a production line to consistently, reliably uh, mm -hmm. make an AM part. So, but mm -hmm. at least that's that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, I, that's funny. We did not talk about this before, but I have to 100% agree. It's like the number of times I've printed one-off parts and then like seen them die, uh, I couldn't tell you. But yes. having customers <laughs> that have the appetite and understand like, what they're getting into and want to pursue additive manufacturing as a true manufacturing technology. Like that's where it's really fun to see yep. people bring parts into production and they're serious about using the technology. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, 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 you know, the, the, the scaling piece that we talked about and some of the challenges that I, I would say legacy AM platforms have, um, we have seen customers that come to us and they're like, Hey, you know, I can't scale like this. Um, and like, as soon as I see that, I'm like, okay, this is the perfect customer. Like they're going to get it. Right. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. I think, I think we're on the same page there. Yeah. I, th I think it's interesting because like, also I think we are talking about these critical parts because it's the easiest to make the business case. It's easy because if it's a rocket nozzle or if it's a combustion chamber or if it's a satellite part, but we are seeing that customer group expand, right? We are seeing more and more different, people in different industries joined that from then a couple of years ago only, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So somebody, the, the uh, intrepid anonymous attendee again, uh, like no, what cars for Velo could be used in the car industry like GM? So you guys were literally use that turbo machinery example said, Hey, you know what? <laughs> cars doesn't, doesn't work. Right. There's a lot of interest in the, in the industry generally in automotive, but are there parts on a car that we that, that do have that specific value, that value density that you think, hey, that might work, or do you just not think that that's a, a the, the 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 best thing there? I, I I'd have to ask you what car are you trying to put them on? Um, exactly. Because exactly. <laughs> it's like your Honda Accord. Uh, no, if you're yeah. trying to put it on a you know five hundred thousand dollar Ferrari, yeah, I'm sure we could squeeze a part in there. Um, in reality, like mainstream automotive, uh, high volume automotive, it's not going to make sense for a while. Um, yep. where it does make sense in automotive at the moment is on the tooling side where you're producing low volumes of components that are then producing high volumes of 
of parts, if that makes sense. So you produce the parts that produce the end automotive part. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. And, and I think we, you know, we found at least, um, on what we're doing, right. It, you know, we, we got our bellow, we got our start with, uh, some of our low angle capability. Right. And, and I think that's actually surprisingly where we're differentiating ourselves in that space, right. Um, automotive customers who want to print like high pressure die cast cooling, um, are able to leverage that low angle process and go bigger and bigger, uh, with these channels, uh, these internal cooling channels, then, um, you know, uh, they were, they were able to before, which I think that was, you know, the limit of DFAM is like half an inch or something like that. Right. Um, but we're able to go much larger than that. And that's where we see a lot of differentiator, uh, shape differentiation with our product, um, for, for these types of customers. No, definitely. The only automotive part I can think of in a mass manufactured automobile is you can make an electric car component, like a heat sink that could make, like extend the range of the car. If they had a better range than a competitor and all of a sudden they, it, then they maybe get interested, but yeah, that, 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 that's still going to be, I think it's nice that you guys are saying that. I mean, it's nice to be utopia. Like we're going to make everything, but it's nice to see like kind of more realism and people say, you know what? No. <laughs> so yeah. I like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's it's, I think no is also like very important with like, you know, mm -hmm. customers that try to print anything, right. It's like not, we're not saying that additive is going to solve all your problems, but uh, where it makes sense, it'll definitely hit it out of the park. Yeah, and to that point, like additive is not a replacement for machining. Additive is not a replacement for castings. Uh, it's complementary, right? I'll say 98% of additive parts, maybe even higher, require some form of machining. So yeah. those two technologies are very complementary. And when you use them right and use them together, it becomes a very powerful combination. Oh yeah. And that's, I mean, that, that's exactly what's happening at, you know, contract manufacturers, right? They're, they're not seeing as like a, like a threat, for example, they're embracing it and they're expanding that capability. Um, so that's been nice to see. Okay. So from Wefeng, Wefeng Luo, uh, we've got a question. Is per the data achieved so far, what is the dominant variation? Is laser, gas flow, or powder bed or others? So that probably is like the machine to machine variation we saw in, in these slides that seem to have piqued everyone's interest. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's it's a little bit more complicated than that, I think. Uh, uh, yeah. But 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 this is this is also a really yeah, it's a it's a good question, but I think it'd be a difficult one to answer. But you, I don't know if you guys want to have a stab at it, but it's a um, phenomenal question. <laughs> it's a really hard one to answer because uh, you're talking pretty small amounts of variation and a lot. I don't want to say a lot of that. Uh, a big piece of that is is honestly powder as well. Um, and that's, I think, something where the industry is, is lacking in terms of understanding is variation of powder, not only from a single powder manufacturer and lot to lot, but like powder manufacturer to powder manufacturer. I don't think we have a good understanding of what all it, or the call it critical process variables of powder to make sure that that input feedstock is uh, contributing to that repeatability. Um, it's yeah. things we're still trying to learn. Yeah, like packing density and uh, just the agglomerations of these powders. And, and you guys are tackling the one thing with the with looking at the height mapping of the bed. Hey, what are the particle sizes? Round is good, very round is good. And then at one point it stops being good. It's like, yeah. Yep. Uh, so that's, uh, that's gonna be the next phase, I think. Um, so we've got a question uh, from, uh, well, from Zavin Gurigagosian. Uh, is the post-manufacturing remaining metal powder recoverable, recyclable? Uh, yeah, I don't know what they mean by recoverable, but uh, yeah. You want to take that, Matt? Or? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work out there today. Um, <laughs> the... I think there's a lot of talk about additive being a very green process and like using a lot less material than traditional manufacturing, but not a lot of people talk about the wastes in additive, which honestly, a lot of it comes down to powder and um, recycling powder. And what do you do when powder has been used X many times and oxygen content's gone out of spec. Um, but there's a number of companies out there that are kind of refurbishing powder, reconditioning powder, um, even taking consolidated metal and kind of like chopping it up and grinding it up and making new powders with it. So going to old scrap yards and, and finding these high valuable 
alloys that you know, no one knew what they could do with and turning it into new feedstock for additive manufacturing. Um, it's, it's a newer thing that's in the industry, but uh, certainly something that people are starting to focus on. Mm. I'm still exciting. waiting for somebody. Oh, sorry. Uh, Sid, sorry. No, I'm just saying it's, it's exciting to see that type of innovation happening. No, definitely. I'm still waiting for somebody to buy one of those aircraft boneyards and just try to like recycle the whole boneyard for powder. <laughs> Uh, that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity. Like the kilo, this is a great deal. I look at how much this boneyard costs. Anyway, uh, so uh, Mukan, we'll Paris, <laughs> Mukan Parisami, uh, and is wants to know what are the alloys you have produced so far for different applications. Yeah. Um, so I mean, we we as Velo, right? We did get our start um, in the space sector, and so you know we've 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 got a lot of materials driven by that industry to start with, right? So uh, we're talking about um, nickel alloys, um, 718, 625, Haynes 282, that type of stuff. Um, since then, we've expanded into titanium, Ti 64s, uh, aluminums, like an F357. Uh, we've gotten into copper um, as well. Uh, the automotive industry is driving us towards uh, M300. Um, we're looking at another uh, stainless steel um, and, uh, I think a high strength aluminum as well. I don't know if I already said that, but, um, essentially, you know, we've got a lot of different options and certainly reach out to us to see if, if, you know, we've got something available. Um, but we tend to be very, very customer driven. Right. Um, and so if there's a need for it, um, then, then yeah, let's, let's definitely talk. Um, and then another thing that's a little bit unique to what we do, right. Is if a customer purchases a system from us and says, you know, I want this X, Y, Z alloy. Um, we typically develop that material for free, assuming that it's technically feasible, but, um, but it comes with the purchase of a machine, right? So we're not going to say, Hey, you got to buy a machine and then a bunch of consulting fees on top of that to go develop that alloy. Um, so that's a little bit unique too. Um, I think, did I miss any other alloys, Matt? Um, I think I covered um, most of them. No, I was just going to say, I, I'm, I'm sure we did, but all of our alloys are listed on our website and there are data sheets for each one. So you can get, you know, rough idea of properties and things like that. Yeah, definitely. And you could just generally also email info at villa3d.com to get your answers. And don't forget, we can also uh, download the white paper to get some more information as well. Um, so if you want to get in a quick, quick question, I think we have time for about one, maybe two more if it's short, but the last question then, or the maybe last one, if you have a really great one on the uh, end there, is well, what types of industries would Vela be good for and what specific aspect? I think the aspect things would be a bit difficult, but yeah, you know, what kind of things would really draw some industries to, 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 to using your, your, your system? I, I think if you back away from industry and focus in on application, uh, what we generally say is that if your application is managing fluid flow or heat transfer or something similar that has some level of complexity to it, um, it's a really good place to start for additive. Um, the, if you want to put like a cherry on top, if you have an existing problem or challenge with your application that is doing these things like quality or lead time or functional performance, um, you likely have a decent application in front of you that you should consider additive for. Um, that being said, if, and, and I think I mentioned this earlier, if you have a, you know, a part that you're just looking to reduce cost on and you're not really trying to hit on any of those other things, uh, you're making it traditionally today, you're likely not going to see value in going to additive manufacturing. Um, so without mentioning specific industries, that's how to kind of at a really high level and analyze your applications. And then you, you then put that into context, context of industry. Like, are you working in a very low cost industry, call it automotive, um, where maybe there is no potential because everything is, you know, on the order of they're counting pennies, not hundreds of dollars. Um, so yeah. All right. Hey, guys, thank you so much, Sid and Matt. Thank you. This is really good. I really, really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for, for doing this today. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Uh, and thank you for, for listening. Thank you for asking all your questions. Uh, there's a 
cut above on the questions there. We've got a lot of really, really difficult questions. We've been doing this for a while and uh, got some really kind of technical stuff. So it's always nice to see. I hope this was valuable for you. Uh, again, it's info at velo3d.com if you want to uh, reach out. If you have any kind of questions that were unanswered or you didn't want to answer because uh, you don't want to do it publicly, please reach out to the guys and they can answer it to, uh, it to you directly. Hey, thank you so much for your time today. My name is Joris Peels. This is uh, brought to you by Smart Tech Analysis, working together with Velo3D. Have a great day.